The brand promise, if you ask me, of the British royal family right now is to be an institution that's not just driving the tourists to Britain, but to be an institution that reminds Britain of its pride of place in the world. To be an ambassador of goodwill and virtue, if you will, for Britain. The firm, one of the central parts of it is a very stable family life, but that's not reality because we're dealing with individuals who don't always behave like that. I wouldn't have said they're that typical, but they certainly are a family and they have the problems of a family because although they have the privileges, they also have the responsibilities. The lower down the pecking order you go is the more reluctant the members of the family are to live up to their responsibilities. Some do it, some don't. Welcome to episode eight of The Firm, Blood, Lies, and Royal Succession. I'm Jonathan Locke, your host on this journey through half a millennium of royal secrets and scandals, where we're also revealing how pulling the strings behind the scenes for all that time has been The Firm, working to ensure that no matter what else happens, the royal brand emerges intact, no matter what the cost. It's always been a cat and mouse game between historians and the royal family and those around them in terms of how the image is portrayed. But my job as a historian is to try and tell the truth about the past, not to cover up people's peccadillos. In this episode, we're turning to the incendiary impact Sarah Ferguson, ex-wife of the disgraced Prince Andrew, has had on the firm. What I do know is that she's the one person that Prince Philip would not have anything to do with. He and Fergie were not, well, he didn't like Fergie. She knew that she wasn't welcome when Prince Philip was around. Well, Fergie's not one of my favourite royals. On March 19th, 1986, Prince Andrew, second son of the Queen and at the time fourth in line to the throne, announced that he was engaged to be married. For the British public, the news came as something of a surprise. Jacqueline Roth, executive editor of the RoyalObserver.com, explains why. In the 1980s, Andrew was very much known as the Playboy Prince, with high-profile flings with a whole string of beautiful women. He was definitely not the settling-down type. The most high-profile of these ex-girlfriends of Andrew's was actress Coo Stark, but that relationship hit the rocks after it had emerged that she had starred in the erotic drama Emily several years before. When it emerged that Koo Stark had been in an adult movie, it may have ensured the end of her relationship with the prince. But it also very much played into the Randy Andy image Andrew had at the time. It actually enhanced his image, if anything. After the glamour of his previous flings and the salacious revelations about Koo Stark, the decidedly un-Hollywood Sarah Ferguson could not have been more of a contrast. But as it turned out, Andrew and Sarah had a long history together. Here's historian and biographer Andrew Loney and royal commentator Eloise Parker. Yes, it's a very interesting relationship. I mean, they've known each other, of course, since they were children. The parents were friends. Her father was the Queen's polo manager. And so they sort of were almost like brother and sister as they grew up. When Andrew met Sarah Ferguson, she was also running in aristocratic circles. There was never a question that she would be a very suitable wife. He'd dated actresses and models and he kind of had his fun. And there seemed to be a real personality match, both incredibly exuberant, fun-loving, but unfortunately with a slightly irresponsible streak that left them very ill-equipped to spend long periods apart in the name of duty. After years of playing the field, Andrew's betrothal to Sarah Ferguson was a relief to the senior royals. Finally, the playboy prince was going to settle down with a suitably upper-class British match. And initially, her bubbliness, clear sense of fun and willingness to get stuck in made her very popular with the British public, too. She was even given a nickname, Fergie. Here's royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. When Fergie married Andrew, she was regarded as a breath of fresh air. And the family was one that they knew. She was someone who had a past, but it didn't matter. 
By the time of their wedding in July 1986, public feeling towards the royal family was arguably at an all-time high. Britain, and indeed the world, was still in the throes of Diana Mania after her wedding to Prince Charles five years earlier, and Andrew himself was still basking in the adultation he received for serving in the Falklands War of 1982. Andrew was a war hero at the time. He's a service as a helicopter pilot in the Falklands War. He was 22 years in the Navy, and that was where he, I think, was in Eve, seemed at happy there, and also he did rather well there. Subsequently, he has had a very different future. Fergie and Andrew were fun. They were lively, they seemed a modern, more with it contrast to the stuffy old royals. Fergie especially was seen as what the British call a game girl. Hindsight, of course, is a wonderful thing, but even at the time, not everyone was quite so taken with the fun, lively royal couple. There were whispers that the senior members of the royal family had their doubts about Sarah Ferguson, and even that she was quietly taken aside and instructed on the proper way for a princess to behave. So my name is Grant Harold, a.k.a. The Royal Butler. I'm a former member of the Royal Household of the Prince of Wales and Dutch of Como. And my duties saw me looking after, obviously, the Prince uh, and the Duchess, but also Princes William and Harry, and of course, most famously, the Queen on occasions. So there was this little rumour going round that, and I always put the record straight in it because it's my area. You know, someone said to me that when you join the Royal Family, they run etiquette classes, I was like, what, what etiquette classes? Oh, so if you join the royal family, you have to have classes so you know how to behave and how to act. Complete nonsense. Grant Harold may be dismissive of the idea that Sarah Ferguson had received etiquette classes, but perhaps she should have. It didn't take long before Fergie's game girl image and naturally boisterous nature became less of an attraction and more of an embarrassment. Sarah Ferguson's idea of being royal was best summed up by one of the courtiers who said, vulgar, vulgar, vulgar. This fine line between a fun royal and a vulgar royal was well and truly crossed in 1987, when Fergie and Andrew, along with Prince Edward and Princess Anne, took part in something called the Grand Knockout Tournament, otherwise known as It's a Royal Knockout. It was a special charity edition of a popular TV show in which contestants competed across a series of obstacle courses in fancy dress, all while being bombarded with water cannons and custard pies. Here's Fergie, captain of the Blue Bandits team, being interviewed at the start of the show by host Stuart Hall, himself later convicted of multiple sexual offences against children. But perhaps that is the subject of another podcast entirely. It was every bit as toe-curlingly awful as you might imagine. Our Royal Highness, the Duchess of York, Mum, how is the state of your health? Because it was inclement this morning, I'm afraid. It's uh, very good, thank you very much. But everyone else is going to suffer after we win. Will the throat hold out? Oh, of course it will hold out. Now, what are the ace cards that you're holding, Mum? Well, we don't, we don't have any cards because basically we're the best. We're the best blue bandits there are. <laughs> okay? Hey, hey, hey. 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 That ridiculous, it's a royal knockabout. That's admittedly, there were other royals involved in that, and it was awful. But it's an example of she had an attitude which was very unfortunate. It later emerged that the Queen was not in favour of the event and that her courtiers had, quote, advised against it. Oh my god, it's a royal knockout is so bad. It's worth looking up on YouTube just for how horribly embarrassing it is. And it was just the start. Nine months later, Fergie and Andrew took a state visit to California in which they were taken apart in the British press for, and I can quote it here, a brash, vulgar, excessive, weak-humored exhibition by two royals. Ouch. The press said worse than that. With what now seems like uncanny foresight, the British newspaper The Sunday Times described Andrew as an overanimated young man with a carnivorous grin, who, no matter how many dinner jackets he wore, would still look like a third division footballer, that's soccer player, out for a good time at the Hippodrome. Fergie, the paper continued, looked as if she'd won third prize for her Carmen Miranda impression at an end of pier show at some forgotten resort. 
I mean, the gloves were well and truly off, and even after the births of princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, Fergie remained very unpopular with the British press. Not only the press. She was always seen as a bit of embarrassment. Prince Philip didn't like her. But how fair was the criticism of the Duchess at the time? As we now know, behind closed palace doors, she was struggling. Eloise Parker and Andrew Loney explain. Prince Andrew, of course, was in the Navy while, you know, Sarah was starting a family. She famously described herself as having been basically alone throughout her first pregnancy with Princess Beatrice. He was often away at sea. She claimed that she only saw him 40 days in a year for the first five years of their marriage. And I think that was a big problem. I think she found it very difficult to integrate herself into the royal family as an outsider, even though she'd grown up with the royals and her father was in effect part of the royal household. By early 1992, just six years after their wedding, the marriage had broken down completely and the couple announced their separation. The facts are with the Duchess of York that she got impatient with Andrew away so much. She also liked high living and the marriage gradually disintegrated. Here's Stuart Pearce, who was vocal coach to Princess Diana. It's interesting that they came together in a time of iridescent shifts of consciousness within the British nation. They came together where they were both evidently too immature to come together into a significant bond called marriage. Andrew was away for the first seven months of their year together for an ebullient, effervescent, extrovert, exploding energy, naturally exploding energy of Sarah. This must have been really challenging for her. Unfortunately, Fergie's response to this challenge was to seek comfort elsewhere. In January 1992, her unusually close friendship with Texan multimillionaire Steve Wyatt was exposed, including photographs of Wyatt with a toddler, Princess Beatrice. And seven months later, an even more disastrous set of pictures hit the newsstands. The Royal Observer.com executive editor, Jacqueline Roth. On August 20th, 1992, Britain's Daily Mirror newspaper splashed with photos of Fergie and her so-called business advisor, John Bryan, on holiday in Saint-Tropez, France. To say the pictures were sensational would be a huge understatement. In them, Fergie and Bryan can be seen cavorting in the swimming pool, kissing while Princess Eugenie looks on, and most scandalously, one shot where the Duchess is having her toes sucked by her American business advisor. The entire print run of 3.5 million sold out by 9 a.m. and the palace was horrified. She had an affair with that Texan and there were those pictures taken where the Texan was sucking her toes at some resort while she was still married to Prince Andrew and those got published and Prince Philip was absolutely outraged by that and basically said after they got divorced that she was never allowed to be around him again. I think that Fergie has handled herself very, very badly during her marriage. And we had that famous incident where she was caught by the Daily Mirror, I believe, and photographed sucking the toes of her Texan lover. So it was not the best time for it all to happen. You never knew what was going to appear in the Sunday papers every week. Was it going to be new photographs? Was it going to be new accusations? And I think when the incredibly embarrassing evidence of infidelity and came to light in the British media in the early 90s. It was combined with Sarah's desire to be more independent, and they had no choice but to divorce. The divorce was finalised on 30th of May 1996, just three months before the official split of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. It was an incredibly tricky time for the Queen. And it wasn't just because Windsor Castle burned down. She was also witnessing, you know, the, the burning down of these two marriages that were really supposed to hold the future of the British monarchy together. It was even reported that around this time, the Queen's sister, Princess Margaret, responded to a bouquet of flowers sent to her by Fergie with a letter that said, you have done more to bring shame on the family than could have ever been imagined. 
Despite it all, Stuart Pearce can't help but feel sorry for the Duchess. When you're feeling unloved and somebody comes along and says, you're so beautiful, all of us become susceptible. So I feel that that's what took place. The difficulty was that she wasn't very discreet about what took place, you know, in terms of the people that she um, had affairs with or whatever. And as a result of that, the British press got hold of it and it was all blown completely out of proportion. And then they got divorced. And who doesn't like their toes being sucked? <laughs> But if Fergie thought that was to be the end of her troubles, she was gravely mistaken. Divorce from Prince Andrew brought a whole new set of challenges. After her divorce from Prince Andrew, she wasn't entitled to any of the money from the civil list, which is the funds that are released from the British government to the royal family, essentially the taxpayer money that helps subsidise the royal family. So she was financially more out on her own when the Queen famously asked Sarah what she wanted at the time of the divorce, and Sarah replied, your friendship, ma'am. She didn't want to walk away with a giant sum of money, even though she probably could have, given everything that had happened. She wanted to be independent, and she wanted to pay her own way. Of course, that wasn't quite as easy as it perhaps looked like it might be, and that led to its own set of problems. Sarah Ferguson may have been out of the royal family, but she was loath to give up the extravagant lifestyle to which she had become accustomed. And her efforts to make the kind of money needed to do that only brought more scorn from her critics. Here's royal reporter Richard Menards. Citing any settlement with Fergie was a lot less than certainly Diana got. And maybe the fact that she was basically hawking herself to do promotions or do anything to earn her a check is indicative of how little she got. And I think that also got her in a lot of trouble. The Duchess of York has sold everything from children's books to weight loss regimes to tea towels. You know, it sort of seemed like no product was beyond Fergie when it came to getting herself on QVC and trying to put some money in the bank. She's famously a bit of a spendthrift and unfortunately that meant she had to kind of doff her cap and try and uh, get the money from wherever she could for a while. There isn't a great deal of, uh, I would say, respect here, perhaps more in the States, because she seemed to be someone who sort of takes advantage of a royal position for her own personal gain. By 2010, Fergie's company, Hartmore LLC, had collapsed with debts of $770,000, around a million dollars in today's money. Later that year, it was reported that she was considering declaring voluntary bankruptcy with debts of over £5 million, the equivalent of some $8 million today. And it was at this point when Fergie made her biggest mistake yet. It's the videotape seen around the world, the Duchess of York and an undercover setup. Sarah Ferguson was caught taking a bribe in exchange for offering access to her ex-husband, Prince Andrew. Is that you? Yeah. On Friday, I sat down with Sarah and here's how she explains what happened. In May 2010, Britain's News of the World published a stunning sting. Fergie caught on tape, offering an undercover reporter posing as an Indian businessman access to her ex-husband for £500,000 and then accepting a briefcase containing $40,000 in cash. Yeah, and then when she was trying to sell access to Prince Andrew in some fake Arab shape for a few million dollars and it all got very seedy and sordid and I think that didn't do her reputation uh, which was pretty low in any way, any good. But I think he knew about that too. Prince Andrew knew about her being willing to take money from a sheik who actually was a reporter in disguise trying to buy access to Prince Andrew, so that wasn't good. The tape was unequivocal and utterly damning. Listen for yourself. Let's see. 500,000 pounds when you can to me. Open doors. New Prince Andrew. Yeah. Is that a deal? Yeah. And then that is, is then like, then you open up all the channels, whatever you need, whatever you want. Yes. And then that's what, then, then you meet yes. Andrew and... 
On June 1st, in a desperate attempt to rescue something of her reputation, Fergie appeared on Oprah. While hardly as damning as her ex-husband's performance on Newsnight would be a decade later, her attempts to justify her actions were still pretty woeful, to say the least. So he had come and somebody I needed, a friend of mine needed $38,000 as urgently. So he had said, I will give you that $38,000 for my, for, for my friend. And that's why I needed the money urgently for my friend. Mm -hmm. And so I was crying and I thanked him so much for helping my friend. Mm -hmm. And he knew the friend, mm -hmm. knew of the friend. And, and it, so, th and I was just... That's the moment when you agreed to, we've heard $40,000. So was it 40 or 38? Well, it was 40, okay. but there was 38. Okay. He gave me 40, but that was all going to my friend. And you were doing that for a friend? I, well, yeah, but there's, for me... Is that what happened to that money? What happened to that money? It's gone back to the newspaper. And her eventual apology, far from sounding sincere, seemed more like an expression of self-pity. For me, it's not about that. This interview is not about whether it's for the friend or who said mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. or whether I was drunk or not drunk or drinking or not drinking. It's about the fact that um, I, have inadver I have, through my actions, hurt millions of people, all my friends, um, my family first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And... And I must, I believe that from this, it's almost like I've freed Sarah from the treadmill of her, of her life, really, of her long life of trying to be perfect. For the firm, and Prince Philip in particular, it was beyond the final straw. She hadn't an idea what being royal really meant. If she had, she wouldn't have behaved as she did. And after that, Prince Philip decided that she was just out of it. He would never deal with her, would not attend events with her. And of course, the Queen, being the subservient wife, agreed with him, basically. And so Fergie was totally out of the picture. But it was also, it wasn't just the awful lapses of judgment. It was an attitude to royal life. But I think he basically was so angry with her for embarrassing the family like that, that he basically declared her persona non grata at the royal family. Philip's role has always been the diehard retainer of the duty, the obligation, the responsibility, and the heritage of, of the British royal family, and particularly his spouse, the Queen. And I'm sure, because we know that he, he had a would we say a short tongue, you <laughs> know, that he often spoke his truth. I'm sure that Sarah would have heard from Philip, just as Diana did, about his review of her conduct. So she would have been chastened by that. So low was Fergie's currency that public opinion even turned against her daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie. Well, they didn't really have proper jobs. They were always on holiday. They seemed to freeload off people, often rather unfortunate people. They just lacked sometimes the touch that was needed. I think they tried hard uh, and they did try and do some public engagements. And of course, there was always this problem that Charles wanted to streamline monarchy and Andrew felt his daughters were entitled to, to be part of the royal family. And so they, there was this, this sort of standoff at the various times. You know, there was concern that they weren't really doing royal duties, but were actually running up huge costs on security, often just to cover their lifestyle, their gap years. They too acquired a nickname, the Pampered Princesses. I think Beatrice in particular kind of struggled a bit more to find her feet as a working royal. There was an awful lot of traveling going on, an awful lot of expensive vacations. And if it's one thing the British public don't like to see, it's their tax money being spent on extravagant royal vacations, because whether they're paying for them or not, the image of it is that it's coming out of public money and it's just not a good look. In the face of such scorn, Sarah Ferguson finally made a good choice and retreated from the limelight. She now lives in the Royal Lodge in Windsor, and some charity work aside, 
largely keeps a low profile. Well, I think Fergie has terrific loyalty to her husband and to the Queen and to the institution. So I think the problem with her is she just has this unfortunate habit of putting her foot in it. She's not the brightest of people, and so she will say unfortunate things. She's exuberant and spontaneous and not always very careful about what she does or says. So she's always going to be potential for embarrassment, but I think her heart's there. Fergie has definitely remained very close to both our daughters. You know, she's travelled a lot internationally. She spent stints living in the US, but she still spends a lot of time in the UK and she actually spends a lot of time behind closed doors still with the royal family. You know, she famously assisted Meghan when Meghan was first brought into the royal fold and kind of gave her a quick course on how to address the Queen the first time she met her. So I think while she's been much maligned in the media, she's actually maintained a pretty good relationship with senior royals behind the scenes. And I think, you know, that continues today. She's been very supportive of Prince Andrew, which may be something that ultimately backfires on her, depending where his story ends up. She seems to have settled down and kind of found her place as a dating grandma and confidant of senior members of the royal family. Not only is Fergie living at the Royal Lodge and reportedly involved in royal life once more, albeit behind the scenes, but it has even emerged that she shares that house with ex-husband Andrew. These two people may be divorced in the, the courts of law, their marriage may have been annulled, but they're still living together. Could Andrew and Fergie actually remarry? No, they won't remarry, no. Well, because I don't feel it's necessary. They're, they're living connubial bliss together. They don't need a piece of paper saying we're married. But however well Sarah Ferguson might have quietly worked to restore some kind of reputation, for Richard Fitzwilliams at least, Fergie's past indiscretions have effectively sealed her fate. I don't think people want to see more of Fergie. I don't think that there's anything to rehabilitate. She really, really didn't know what it meant to be royal. She wasn't responsible. And also, in living beyond her means, the debts, it's not enough to jump up and down and make a spectacle of yourself. It's not enough to appear on Oprah and say, it's all the fault of little Sarah. That is her alter ego, because she didn't do any wrong, little Sarah did, and so forth. It may be in the future that, you know, she and Andrew, as I say, live together, they get on terribly well, and uh, they have a happy family with their daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie, and, of course, their families. Both are married now, so that is that. But there's no comeback of any sort. I don't think she'd necessarily want one, given the circumstances. And, as a bitter twist of irony, it is now Sarah Ferguson's association with Prince Andrew that has become the heaviest millstone around her neck. To many, the vulgar Duchess and the disgraced Prince are as bad as each other. They both live quite extravagantly, given the income they should be having, and they're always getting into a mess and having to be bailed out. She claimed that um, she could give people access to him uh, and was caught in a sting operation with a newspaper here which he denies, but of course she was operating on his behalf. And he certainly, I think, traded his, his access for, for cash. So, you know, they're always getting into financial scrapes. They're, they're very much cut from the same cloth. Because if you had a poll, people who wanted to see Death of Andrew on the balcony at Buckingham Palace again, Death and Lone Sarah Ferguson, you wouldn't get it into double figures. So, you know, they might remarry. They are close. Fair enough. But what you had was somebody who didn't have any idea of being royal meant what being royal meant. If you've got privileges, you've also got duties. If you've got duties, then you should at least attempt to be responsible. There's no interest in seeing more of Fergie or indeed her in any sense uh, becoming or rejoining. I mean, she couldn't. It's, it's not feasible because she's divorced from Andrew, who stepped down in disgrace, and she was in disgrace several times. Whether due to her own history of missteps and scandals, or as collateral damage following the recent stripping of Andrew's titles, as of December 2021, Fergie has not been listed on the section of the royal family's official website titled Members of the Royal Family. 
But if she remains out of the firm, public opinion has at least shifted where her daughters are concerned. Here's Sally Odness, author of Royal Fever, the British monarchy in consumer culture. So these two young ladies who actually, and I'm going to just say this very bluntly, they have these disasters for parents, Prince Andrew and Fergie, okay? She's made horrible judgments, you know, just constantly apologizing for all the bad judgments she's made. But the two young women have actually lived in this kind of bubble where these uh, reputations have not really tainted. Their parents' reputations have not really tainted them. I think they can be very helpful to the royal family because, of course, we've already, quote, lost two other members of that generation, Harry and Meghan. Andrew Loney and Eloise Parker believe that princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, now both in their 30s and settled with husbands and children of their own, have the ability to rescue something from their parents' tattered reputations. They were barely in grade school when their parents finally divorced in 1996. And I think being lowered down the royal pecking order has definitely allowed Beatrice and Eugenie more freedom to work and travel and become more fully formed adults. Eugenie even lived and worked in Manhattan for a while, working for an auction house where she had a surprisingly wide circle of friends, certainly compared to William and even Harry's. Of course, there was a lot of criticism with, with them as freeloaders and in some ways being shaped by their parents' activities to sponge off people and have a role of dodgy friends and always be on holiday. But they've all settled down. They have partners that have been out of the sort of headlines. Yeah, I mean, I think that Beatrice and Eugenie get a tough rap in the media, really. It's a bit convenient that they're not quite as glamorous and not quite as well turned out as the likes of Kate and Meghan. So they're sort of you know, they become a bit of a punching bag, a bit of a punchline um, in the British media. But when you really look at who they are, they're quite impressive young women who've really remained scandal free. They're both married. They've both started their own families. They have nothing to gain by courting publicity beyond the occasional birth announcement and charity event. And I suspect we'll be not seeing an enormous amount of them from here on in. They get trotted out as royals with excellent name recognition and they're scandal free by far they're not the most compelling members of the royal family at this moment and i'm sure they hope it stays that way as has happened so often through the centuries the hope of the firm lies not with the current crop of senior royals but in the generations to come it may be that the best thing that Andrew and Fergie could do for the royal brand would be to quietly retreat and let their daughters get on with it. Hopefully they'll settle down and live a quiet life because if the public, as they say, want to divest him of doing any more official and royal duties, then he'll just become a very wealthy older man living with his uh, older ex-wife come new wife uh, at Royal Lodge, being visited by his daughters and their children and obviously, hopefully, living a happier lifestyle. And if anybody was paying me to advise the royal family, what I would say is, Andrew, make a deal with your brother that you're going to go away quietly, but that your two daughters could have a role in the royal family because recently they have been spots of joy for the brand. So in my opinion, Prince Charles is going to be almost 80 when he becomes the king. He's going to need this generation of folks to keep the royal family vibrant. Because another thing in consumer culture that is very, very important as a meta narrative to keeping brands vibrant is youthfulness. The world is obsessed with youthfulness, right? So we love young kings and young princes, and you know we like to follow their exploits and all. And when Prince Charles is eighty, what are we going to be? What are we going to be doing? Then again, perhaps the younger royals aren't such good prospects after all. Next time on the firm, blood lies in royal succession. Sex. Somebody decided that I'll take a picture of Harry with no clothes on and sell that as well. Okay, it was wrong. Of course it was. Drugs. And this is where Charles sent him to a halfway house to see the effects of drugs, to learn about this. Harry, if you continue down this path, you're going to be one of these people in my charities. 
that are seeking my help to get onto a program to fix yourself. And rock and roll Nazi fancy dress parties. It's yet another case of William having fun and Harry taking it slightly too far. I mean, dressing up as a, in a Nazi uniform is never, ever going to be excusable in the press. And of course, it was an intensely embarrassing moment for everybody. The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession is a production of Audology, a division of Empire Media Group. The series is hosted by me, Jonathan Locke. Executive producers are Dylan Howard and Melissa Cronin. The series is written by Dominic Utton, reporting by Douglas Montero, mixing and sound design by Sean Kravitz. Please subscribe to The Firm wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating, review, and tell your friends.